<clears throat> it is wonderful to have you all here this evening on this wonderful, wonderful evening. It feels so good outside. It does. So, um, keep in mind those who aren't with us this evening that I saw five or six, seven emails come out of people who are going to be staying home tonight. Uh, just keep them in your prayers. This evening we're going to continue our class on human philosophies um, and evangelizing um, on that topic. And before we begin, Chandler, will you lead us in prayer? Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for all the many blessings you've given us. Thank you for giving us the time to come together uh, with Christians of like faith to come and uh, <clears throat> learn more about your word and apply it to our lives. Um, please help us tonight to take into consideration what's taught and to apply it and to go out and use it out in the world. Uh, please give Sean a ready recollection uh, when he's prepared. Uh, thank you for letting your son down the cross so we have an opportunity to be in heaven with you. God, God direct us in your son's name. Amen. Amen. All right. So, like I mentioned last week, this class is going to be focused on uh, communication and evangelizing itself. Uh, we're going to have kind of a, a break here in the middle uh, going from humanism, and then next week, if, if we don't finish tonight, we'll finish up what we're talking about tonight, and then starting with the rest of class next week and all throughout until the last week of class, we will hit on more minor, I say minor, they're actually still pretty heavy and relevant, uh, human philosophies, and one that we'll spend quite a bit of time on is a group of philosophies concerning right versus wrong. And the actions at the end or in the middle, if they, if they are what determine right versus wrong. So we'll, we'll talk about that. I meant to include an image tonight, if, uh, and I forgot to. So what I'll do is if we end up getting through everything tonight, then I'll just broadcast it. Or I might even email it out because it's, it will get you to think. Uh, it's quite enjoyable. Um, if we don't finish tonight, then I'll just plug it in for next week. It'll be great. So, our go-to verse for dealing with human philosophy is the whole purpose of this class, Colossians 2.8, which says... Don't be taken captive by human philosophies. Don't be taken captive by human philosophies. That's right. Do not be taken captive by philosophy and empty deceit according to human tradition, according to the elemental uh, spirits of the world, and not according to Christ. So this evening, we're going to start with some do's and don'ts when it comes to evangelizing. Now, it's not specific to evangelizing with human philosophy on the table. This is just in general. So as we go through the material tonight, don't try to limit it or box it into just human philosophy. Keep in mind that we're going to have conversations every day with people about the Word of God. And whatever is on the other side of that conversation, we still need to have these tools in our in our quiver. So, when we think about some do's and don'ts in speaking to others, <clears throat> the first one I start always, I think we should start with, is don't be defensive when discussing the word. Do remember who you represent. Why would why would this pairing be, at least for me, at the top of the list, but why would this pairing be one of the um, important ones? What ends up happening when we end up being dis uh, defensive? It's off-putting. Uh, mm -hmm. No one wants to listen to you when you're speaking with uh, non intent, I suppose. Yeah. Uh, where does being defensive come from? Fear, right? Fear, I think, is a, a, a large place for it. Uh, I also think when you end up being defensive, it comes from a place of pride. Um, what is our purpose as a Christian? To glorify who? Ourselves or God? God, right. Uh, I think when we are defensive in conversations, especially in relation to the word, we're trying to glorify ourselves, we're trying to take care of our own pride, and not leaving the focus on where it needs to be. And that's on God. Remember who you represent. Christ tells us a number of times that 
He's here to do whose business? The Father's. And anything the Father sent him to do, he was going to do. Anything not sent here for, he didn't, he, I mean, he didn't really care about. Jeremy? One interesting part about the being defensive is that when we're talking to people about the word and things of that nature, we're asking them to be open-minded to be able to be ready to hear you. And if you're not willing to give them that same kind of courtesy, to at least hear what they have to say and, and to not come at it from a, I got to attack everything immediately, uh, you'll kind of get that reciprocal coming back that, that you show them a little bit of respect for you. Just to say, I'm, I'm going to listen to what you have to say. And then present it in the, in the fact that this is what God has to say about it. Now, now right. we can talk about, you know, the next step of why do we know that this is one true God? Okay, we'll talk that next step. You know, mm-hmm. Absolutely. What ends up happening is we, we kind of ball our fists up and turn it into a I have to defeat you sort of mentality because for some reason you've insulted my God or for you've insulted me, you've belittled me, whatever. Becca? Along those same lines, I think it's important to keep in mind that we are often mirroring each other in that. So if one person is being defensive, it's very easy for the other to be defensive. But like Jeremy was saying, we want them to be mirroring that uh, willingness Absolutely. There's already every excuse in the book to reject any conversation to do with God. And we can't have ourselves be that extra excuse. So in line with that, don't take insults personally. Do shake it off and move on. Anytime that you discuss the word with anybody... Even if you're not discussing it, you can see how it's talked about on TV. You can see how it's talked about in movies and in music. They think you're an idiot. But remember that the word was for the simple. It wasn't for those who were on earth who thought themselves wise, right? Mike? I, I, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> I would also say that the, uh, the shake it off and move on also would be within the context of the entire conversation. Yes. That if there is a point in which all they're doing is insulting you, you know, shake the sand off your feet and move on. Shake the dust off your sandals and move on. Yeah, I wouldn't say have any conversation allowed to be derailed because of your personal feelings being hurt. That conversation in that moment might end, but at some point, it could be revisited when both parties calm down. Right. Eric? Just to make it explicit what he was saying, that is exactly where this figure comes from. So if they don't receive it, if you receive a personal insult, shake it off. In other words, shake the dust off your feet and move on. That's exactly where this phrase came from. So. Well, there you go. All right. So I've made my notes smaller on my side so I can actually read them and keep track of them this time in previous classes and I'm going to scroll through, so should be moving better. Um, don't try to show off. Do remain humble. This, I think, is, is important in, in any conversation we have with anybody, but when we are tackling human philosophies, it's very easy to jump in head first and assume this is exactly where they're going. And this is true in, in religious discussions, too. We might encounter somebody who espouses certain Calvinistic views and before we know it, we're throwing the entire book at them on every single Calvinistic idea that they may not actually hold to. They may not even realize it. Um, but also on the, other, on the other side of that is take a step back and realize you yourself are in the same place that they were at one point. You had a notion of what the word of God said and he may not have been right. And it required teaching on your part and learning on your part to also get to where you are now. Okay. <coughs> Don't bite off more than you can chew. Prepare beforehand. Again, if you're going to have a conversation with somebody who comes to your door <coughs> and you want to dive straight into why X is completely wrong, and the word of God completely disarms it. Well, that's a long, long, long discussion. It tends to be. Uh, Becca likes to use the phrase, um, how do you eat an elephant? 
one bite at a time. It's the same. Don't expect in one sitting that you're going to bring a person fr deeply entrenched in human philosophy or in any sort of error right into the work. Sometimes that might happen, absolutely. But don't allow yourself to get sucked into a exhausting fight when you have a moment and another moment. So also prepare beforehand, uh, making sure that if you don't know something and, you're, and you are prone to biting off more than you can chew, take a moment beforehand to pray about it, to dwell on the word, to actually study what it has to say, and equip yourself, right? I mean, that's the whole purpose of, of what much of the word is about. Mike? And this goes a long way, uh, especially with most people, that if you get a question or some kind of scenario or something like that, it's okay to say, you know what, I don't know the answer to that right now, but I'd like to look at it another time. You know, I, I think they'll respect you more if you or if you just start going off on a trail and a tangent or trying to change the subject without really addressing it. You addressed it, but it would, it would just be at a different time. Right. We don't want to approach discussions and studies with others about the word as a politician would. Well, here's a non-answer, and let's move on. No, no. Let's put a, let's put a bookmark there, and you know what? Let me, make, let me write a note, or let me type a note into my phone. Because that's a good question, but I, I don't have the full answer to that right now. And let me come back to it. Eric? One of the ways to prepare yourself as well uh, in sitting with people, because you will fail if you don't do this one thing, and that is you need to sit with yourself before you go to the study and say, everything I'm going to say to this person, I'm going to preface in my mind with, I deeply care about what's going to happen to you, therefore. Absolutely. And if you can't say, if you can't preface everything you're saying to that person with that statement, you shouldn't say it. So, so that's our next point. Don't be distant. Do be empathetic. Remember that every person, even those who are raised in the church, every single person at one point was lost. They are too. And if you can't approach it from a I care for you and I care for your soul, then you're approaching it from the, from the wrong aspect. All right, any other comments on do's and don'ts? Michelle? Don't be discouraged if you don't, if, you get, if what you're telling this person or this group of people, if they don't respond in your presence. I mean, they may not respond in your presence. It may take them years to come to the understanding. Yeah. It's not you that's doing it. Right. That's right. Being patient is key. Okay. Uh, you know, I think I put this slide early. Give me just a second, y'all. No. Okay, we can start here. That's fine. I moved some slides around, and I think it caught me off guard. But that's okay. We'll... Uh, We'll move into this. All right, so paraphrasing is a key weapon in any discussion. And we have a phrase here that allows you to cut into any conversation, to interject into any conversation without it coming across as rude or hostile. Let me be sure I heard what you said. So just with that phrase, that statement alone, and with the idea of what you understand paraphrasing to be, what, was, what are some benefits of this? I have a list of seven or eight, but. Well, first Sorry. off, you, you say back to them what you understand them to have said using different words, mm -hmm. which kind of gives you a better chance of having effective communication with them and not misunderstanding what they said. Yeah. Mike? Well, you can show them that you listen. Yeah. A 
along those lines, and then we'll get to Glenn, along those lines, I had a math teacher in ninth grade, and he gave us a quiz. And the quiz was not a math quiz for us to solve. It was a test to see how well we pay attention, how well we listen. <coughs> we all got it, and about 99% of this class, myself included, went straight to the questions and started solving the questions. And we couldn't believe how easy it was. We got up, we turned it in. There was one kid who just sat there. He didn't get up, he didn't write on it. Well, I guess, I guess he did put his name on it, but he didn't do any of the problems. And this was our valedictorian years later. Uh, smartest guy. And he just sat there. We couldn't figure out you know, why was he just sitting there. And he leaned over to me and he goes, what are you doing? And I've already turned my quiz in at that point. I said, well, I, I did the assignment. You know, we gotta move on. He goes, Sean, look, and it says at the top, don't, don't do anything, write your name on this and sit quietly. And once you finish reading this sentence, that's all you need to do. But it was a test of, are we looking to listen and pay attention or are we looking to solve the problem right away? Glenn? You're, you're paraphrasing, you're building a bond of friendship mm -hmm. and understanding of the other individual. So you're, you're building some, uh, some equal going across to each other rather than putting down on who's doing good, who's doing bad. Right. You, you build a friendship of understanding. Of Absolutely. Uh, Eric, and then we're going to put my list on this board here. So, so active listening was, was mentioned earlier, and mm -hmm. uh, active listening is a very good thing to learn. Uh, one, of the, one of the key insights into developing a habit of doing this, even as an adult, is relax. You have to relax. You don't have enough space in your brain to actively listen and think if you're not relaxed. So if you can relax and listen to what they're saying, then the thoughts will just happen over on the side and then you can switch back to thinking and asking and listening and keep doing that over and over. If you don't relax, you can only do one of those and none of them will. So. Right. Glenn and then well maybe you are swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to write. Right. Absolutely. So uh, my list is it creates dialogue. Being able to paraphrase allows a person to speak for such a stretch of time. And, and, and you know what you're comfortable with. And for you to push in and say, hey, let me, let's, let's break this block down. Let me understand that, that I've heard what you've said. Here's what I believe that you've said. And that directly pushes them to say, you know what? Yes, that's exactly what I'm saying. Or it allows them to tweak that a little bit. Yeah, for the most part, that's what I'm saying, but uh, it was a little bit off here. Let me add a little bit more there for clarification. It ensures understanding of the position. Again, by allowing the listener, or in this case, the paraphraser, to then say back what it is that was just told to them, it allows clarification of what it is you're actually trying to get across. It allows for a gentle correction of what's been said. Um, I don't know about y'all, but I've been married for almost eight years, and uh, it's probably been a few times that gentle correction has been given on what we've said. And it seems to be a pretty common thing in marriage. Uh, and this is one of the things that, that is needed more in every conversation we have. I understand the point that you're making, um, or I believe I understand the point that you're making, and this is what I think it is. Well, for the most part, you're right, but let me add in a little bit more here to support that. Instead of, well, you're never listening, let me jump down your throat. It promotes empathy. <laughs> Being able to listen to what is said to you and regurgitate it in your own words back to the speaker allows them to believe, and for you to believe, that you are placing yourself in their shoes and seeing the world how they're seeing it and understanding it from their perspective. It overcomes internal monologues. How often do you find yourself believing, hey, I said that already? And really, you think you said it, but you only said it to yourself internally. The words never actually came out of your mouth. And so when the person paraphrases or when you paraphrase, it allows the opportunity for that person to realize, you know what, I may not have actually said that out loud. I don't know how many of y'all do it, but for me, whenever I'm speaking to somebody, 
I'm thinking beforehand, okay, this is what I'm going to say next, here's what I'm going to say next, and here's what I'm going to say next. <coughs> and it could be that I went from point one to point three, and I completely forgot about point two, and it's the crutch of the points that I'm making, and they don't get it. So paraphrasing allows there to be a, a repetition of the conversation to overcome this internal monologue. And for those who are around the conversation when it happens, it does allow for some clarification for the conversation. Um, if you're in a coffee shop or if you're in a Bible study and there's more than just two people there, those other people are likely listening to both sides. And this paraphrasing allows for there to be a clarification on their part too because they may not have picked up on every point that was made by the speaker as well. Uh, and then finally, it causes you to better remember the conversation as it goes along. And it keeps it into easy to contain chunks that you can bullet point or even take notes on as you're going. Mike? I think another thing, especially in the marriage realm, is I say something, then Crystal would paraphrase it back, and I'd be like, actually, you know what? It does sound ridiculous. <laughs> yeah? And so it, it echoes when you hear it from somebody else's mouth. It can be like, oh yeah, that, that doesn't make sense at all, you know, or, you know, it's kind of like, yeah, let's just move on because the question doesn't mean anything or you can answer it right away like, oh, that's what it is. Hearing it from somebody else kind of maybe changes it just a little bit or just enough to make it sound, you know, different. Yeah. Okay, so after an understanding what they're saying, and in response to that, oh, John, go ahead. That, that is a uh, learned skill, though. Um, Absolutely. It's, it's one of those things, uh, some of the classes I teach, it's, it's funny because you want students to use a source to justify their position, but they always go to, let's just direct quote what someone else says. That, that doesn't show that you've understood and even read uh, what, what they're talking about. And, and it's the same thing here. Um, you know, and we verses to memory and that's that's great and we should but that's really just the first step of learning and understanding what something actually says right you know if you just stop and say hey i can quote you know all these verses that that doesn't do you any good absolutely absolutely okay so there are phrases to avoid when i wanted to say this too i mean if you're in meetings and you're actually the one doing the notes mm-hmm I do this all the time in our meetings. A lot of times I'll do that very question. Okay, let's go over this now. What exactly was said here? And then I make sure that the notes are all correct and everything, especially, you know, when it comes to the person's soul and everything, and you're talking about <coughs> working with them and learning, you know, to try to help them to save them, it's good to be able to make sure that you got it right. Absolutely. Yeah, we don't want to go out of this haphazardly. That's right. All right, so there are some phrases to avoid uh, when discussing uh, any sort of topic with anybody, but especially when evangelizing. You wouldn't understand. <coughs> well, that kind of seems out of place, right? Like the whole point is to help them bring them to the word, right? Uh, this phrase suggests that this person that you're speaking to is either too ignorant or too stupid to be able to grasp what it is that you're teaching them, or the points that you're trying to make, or the counterpoints that you're trying to make. Don't use this phrase. Um, if they ask a question and you don't know how to explain it to them, it's not their fault if they don't understand. Take it back, write it down, take some time, and then revisit it later. Don't let you want to understand be a stumbling block for the conversation that you're having with somebody. Okay? Or, because those are the rules, or another iteration of that, because that's what the Bible says. Because that's what God says. That is absolutely right. If the, if the Word of God says to not do something, 
That is the truth. Because God said so. But just as we don't do it with our children as they get older, we shouldn't do it with other adults who are essentially on the same level playing field as we are. If you can't take the time to explain what the principle is behind <coughs> the verse that you're using, then you're not equipped to have that study. And that belittles them, and it shows that you don't know what you're talking about and you're untrustworthy. You've got to be careful with that. Um, we don't want to shy away from explaining why these rules exist or these verses exist or what the purpose is behind them. We have very good reason from God because it leads to holiness, because it leads to righteousness and sanctity, because you have a purpose to be serving others, because it fulfills the commandments that I've given to take care of your fellow humans, because it's authorized, because it's not authorized. Don't just leave it at because those are the rules. Calm down. If you've had a conversation with any person ever, especially what seems to be of the female variety, uh, calm down seems to be something that comes to mind quite often. Uh, don't use it when evangelizing. If you're in a conversation, and this was, this was hit on almost the very first thing, if you're in a conversation that insults are flying, don't tell them to calm down. You disengage, and you calm down, and you come back to it later. What tends to happen is another person's angry, and Becca mentioned this earlier, mirroring. When a person's angry, the other person in the conversation tends to mirror that, but we also tend to project that. It could be that it's our own anger, our own stubbornness, our own hostility, or our, our own uneasiness that we're projecting on the other person, and so we think and we interpret how it is that they're acting through that lens of they need to calm down. Um, telling somebody to calm down, however, suggests that they don't have any reason or right to be upset or at odds with what it is that you're saying. And certainly nobody should be at odds with what the Word of God says, because it's the Word of God and God is supreme, right? Yes. But, if you tell somebody, hey, uh, that worldview isn't quite right, you know, murder is unacceptable, and they kind of get upset because they, they kind of like to murder people, well, I can understand you wanting to tell them to calm down, especially, you know, if they like to murder people, you don't want that to happen to you, but... If they're upset because you're discussing with them a topic like marriage, divorce, and remarriage, and they're, in a, they're in, a, in a relationship they're not supposed to be in, and this is the first time they're hearing about it, but they yearn to seek Christ and do what God says, it would be understandable that it would kind of hit them and devastate them. Telling them to calm down doesn't help that. Helping them process through it is what helps them. And that's the same thing in human philosophies, too. Remember... They are in the same boat that you were once in. Okay? They want to understand the world that's around them just as much as you do. But our paradigm, the way that we view the world, is through the Word of God. And for many people, and a growing number of them, as I mentioned in our first class, is no longer through the Word or any sort of theology. It is through human philosophy. What's your problem? Why aren't you getting this? Simply, this is a us versus you mentality. This makes it across the table conversations, when really we should be on the same side of the table. I love you. I care for your soul. There is no problem. It's a, I want what's best for you, and God wants what's best for you, and I want to relay that message that's given to me to you. Because I have hope, and I want you to have that hope. One of the growing issues amongst millennials, um, which I have no idea what age group that is. Uh, I really don't, because decades and everything, right? Uh, the growing issue, one of the growing issues amongst millennials is a lack of hope for the future. That's crushing. 
Um, I had a supervisor when I was working at UT Dallas who his grandmother passed away and it shook him to the core. His work life failed, his personal life failed, everything about him crumbled because his grandmother passed away and he had no idea how to handle it. He had no idea how to move forward from it because he had no hope because he trusted in atheistic worldviews. Okay, uh, avoid absolute generalizations. The never always phrases, these don't help. Um, if you tell a person that you're having a conversation with, well, uh, those who follow this worldview always do this, or y'all never seem to understand this, you're overgeneralizing. It's not unique to the person you're having the conversation with. And, and honestly, it's, it's kind of insulting because you don't want that happening to you. You Christians seem to think that if you just believe in this God, you'll go to heaven. Well, that's not true. And, and while there are Christians who believe that, Christians who believe that, I don't. Because the word very clearly tells me that it's more than just this belief in God. It requires obedience. It requires an understanding and a living of God's will, right? So avoid these never always generalizations. I'm not going to say this again. You've gotten to that point in your conversation where you're kind of fed up with them because they just don't seem to be getting it. Well, I'm not going to have to repeat myself, am I? Yes, you are. You really are. How many, how many times did Jesus say the same thing to his disciples? That the whole reason he was here was to do the Father's will, and that it was going to come a time that he was going to be taken and crucified and killed for our sakes. Don't box yourself in and shut yourself off from being able to <coughs> repeat yourself. Because if the opportunity is there, you need to take that opportunity. And if you've created this line in the sand, this arbitrary line in the sand, you're only costing them their soul. And I want, to, I want you to realize that that's no small thing. And then finally, and we have quite a bit of time left, so let's get some more comments in. Why don't you be reasonable? Well, this suggests that they're being unreasonable, which for them, you're being unreasonable. It's a vicious cycle. Instead of just allowing, Glenn, go ahead. Think that we we can judge other people's motives mm -hmm. based on the previous experience, our own thoughts, and that's not where that comes from at all. That's a danger <coughs> because that stops communication once we determine their motives are effective. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, when we tell, especially when we're discussing human philosophy versus the Bible, and we tell somebody to be reasonable. In their mind, they are. In their mind, they're looking around them and they're seeing the scientific evidence that it's telling them <clears throat> the world is this way and therefore I need to act this way to survive in it. And we would, we're doing the same thing. The word of God says this and therefore I need to act this way to do this thing. Telling somebody or asking somebody why can't you be reasonable insults them. And if you're saying to them, hey, I don't believe that you can be reasonable, what purpose do they have in what purpose do they have in believing and coming to your side of the table? Wyatt? Yep. Wyatt, go ahead. <laughs> um, one common <clears throat> theme through, you know, secular argument and debate classes or logic classes <clears throat> is to operate from the standpoint of assuming that your counterpart has done their research that they um, have some basis for their argument, that they have some background that's relatively reasonable for the position they're taking. And the reason you take that position, you, you <coughs> operate from that position of understanding is so that you're one, prepared yourself, mm -hmm. and two, um, presenting 
arguments and counter arguments that are actually productive and not <coughs> offensive. And I think we kind of tend to, as Christians, throw that out the window and, and go straight to assuming, well, if this person had put any thought to, into it at all, they'd be at the same, reach the same conclusions I have in the snap of a finger, right? But in reality, um, that doesn't reflect the humility that Christ approached it with, that you know, the apostles were approaching it with, and, and keeping that mentality certainly helps in any secular arguments, but even more so will help in these uh, biblical and doctrinal discussions. Absolutely. And we're called to have that too. Um, if at one point you held to a view, for example, uh, we, we can use Romans 14, uh, I believe that I can't eat meat sacrificed to an idol. Well, you believe that for a reason. You came to a conclusion based on some experience in your life or something that you've been taught, right? And what is the brother to do? Teach them and bring them to the truth. Eric? So that's, that's the perfect opponent's theory, what he's talking about. And, and you do need to assume that. Mm -hmm. What you need to assume is that your perfect opponent is a black box that has controls over its inputs as well as its outputs. Mm -hmm. So he's, he is reasonable which is why you don't say don't be unreasonable, because you, you're, you are insulting them at that point. Uh, assume he's a perfect opponent, but assume also that he has blocked out some inputs. Your job as a Christian, as you, as you read it in the Bible, is to be a revelation to them. Bring them the good news, which is news. It is new information. Bring that to them, and hopefully they will include it in their input, mm -hmm. and then their perfect reason will come to Exactly. Why? Go ahead. Sorry, and that's exactly what happened with uh, Aquila and Priscilla presenting the additional information to Apollos, right. and that's I think the perfect example of all of this, right? Yeah, absolutely. Mike, and then we'll move on. Well, it's interesting you put it why we should be reasonable. And on one hand, when we present the gospel to somebody, it's, it comes across as unreasonable to a lot, to pretty much the rest of the world. Yeah. I think about uh, Nicodemus mm -hmm. in John 3, when Jesus said, you must be born again. To Nicodemus, that was unreasonable. I have to be born again. Do I have to go into my mother's womb a second time? This does not make <coughs> sense. And it's not going to make sense uh, because it's, it's a completely different worldview. It's a different way of thinking about things. Uh, you have to get past that. So it's almost like you have to assume that what you're presenting is going to sound unreasonable. Mm -hmm. So it, it's just interesting the way that it was. So I, I catch here at the end of my notes. To us, the word is as, is as straightforward as making a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. I mean, bread, peanut butter, jelly. It's that simple, right? Okay, what kind of bread? What brand of peanut butter? What type of peanut butter? Organic peanut butter? non-organic peanut butter? What kind of jelly? And there's these different varying components on there. But to us, it's very straightforward. It's a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. And we need to bring them to that understanding of how straightforward it is. And that's assuming that they even know what peanut butter is. <laughs> or what jelly is. Right. Or marmalade. Bread. You know, just, and yeah, any of that. It, it, they could be coming in, again, they don't know those terms. They don't know. They could be like, I don't know what peanut butter is. I've never heard of that before in my life. Yeah, I loved how, I loved how that um, and a do's and don'ts part, um, but that's important. When we are discussing anything, is your hand up or are you just? No, my hand is up. Okay, I'll get to you in just a second. Uh, when we're discussing anything with anybody, and Charlie hit on this um, last quarter, we have to realize that the words that we're using may not necessarily be the words that they understand them to mean. Don't let yourself get boxed into that. <coughs> Don't fall for that trap of assuming that they know exactly what the terms are that you're using. You know, I mean, if you look at Paul, for example, he was raised up in the Jewish faith. He lived his life before he became a apostle of Christ, being a follower of the Jewish religion, mm -hmm. doing what he thought was appropriate, killing, prosecuting, persecuting the Christians because he thought that they were wrong. Right. Because he was taught that way. Many times, most times, that when you're talking to someone else, that's what they've been taught. Mm -hmm. That's what 
they believe, because that's all they know. And so we have we have to give them the benefit of the doubt and it can help them understand what it is that they believe is not what necessarily is in the Bible. It's not right. that they're totally wrong, it's just they're missing a portion here, a portion there. Okay, and then understand that he changed his way. Right. So Glenn mentioned uh, kind of this level playing field, this common ground. A lot of people, and we, and we hit through this in, in humanism, remember? They believe that we need to be kind to others. Well, the word of God teaches us to be kind to each other, right? Ephesians 4.32. So there's, there's a lot that we would find with one another, and we need to say, listen, you know, I, I understand why you believe that, and here's why I believe that. But these other things that, you, that you're pushing conflict with if you if you were to harmonize your worldviews, they conflict with one another in some aspects. So here are some things to remember in the last five minutes as we're wrapping up. Every time you open your mouth, you're representing God. Every time you open your mouth to talk to anybody about anything, you are a representative of God because Christ lives in you. So if you open your mouth and you tell a crude joke, are you acting as a good representative of God or a bad one? Okay, so don't tell that crude joke. If you open your mouth to cut somebody down, are you acting as a good representative of God? So then don't cut people down. If you open your mouth to teach the gospel to somebody and you're doing it for the love of their soul, remember that. That's your purpose. And we're wanting them to have the same hope of heaven that we have. This has been mentioned a few times, but we have this eternal life waiting for us. And we want them to have that too. There's not a person in this world that isn't deserving of God's grace or mercy. Because God created them and God loves them. And he expects us to share that with them. Take the leaps. Don't get boxed in, but leap. Listen, empathize, ask, paraphrase, and summarize. Listening is more than just hearing to respond. As Eric mentioned earlier, it's active listening. It's putting any and every thought that you have away and hearing what it is that they have to say. <laughs> Empathize. <coughs> Watching and looking at the world in their shoes so that you can understand why it is that they believe the things that they believe. And when you do that, you best equip yourself to pinpoint and show why it is that God's word says what it says and how it supports or how it negates what it is that they believe. Um, ask. These are fact-finding questions. The who, what, when, why, where, how. These are the general open-ended questions. <coughs> These are the opinion-seeking questions. These are the, the direct questions of, do you see what I mean here? Do you understand what it is I'm saying to you? Can you paraphrase back to me what it is I'm saying to you? And these are also the leading questions. Leading questions are the ones that tend to lead to them being upset. If you believe this, then by that logic, mustn't this also be true? <coughs> and then we've talked about paraphrasing, so we're not going to hit that again. But then summarize. These need to be easy to digest, take home thoughts. If you were to go out to a restaurant and put your food in a doggy bag, it's normally a, a much smaller portion, right? It's easy to digest. That's what those conversations need to end up being. Okay, we're going to talk about this next time. This is what we talked about today. Here's where we had some contention and where I need to go back and look more into it. Here's where I'd like for you to think about and dwell on. Bullet points, action points. Summarize those conversations. Go ahead. I think kind of as a whole, this provides like the good idea is like you should not be necessarily doing like a cookie cutter approach like mm -hmm. you always should be tailoring to the person I mean we see with Paul like 
with the Greeks, he always changed his approach. Or with the Jews, you know, he used Jewish background. It wouldn't make sense, you know, going to the Greeks and trying to talk to them about the history of Judaism and convert them to Christianity right. that way, the same way that it wouldn't have made sense going to the Jews and trying to go off of, like, human philosophy. Right. Which leads us into our final point. Tell them what you're about. Make them understand your purpose. Be upfront with why you care and what's in store for them. Don't shy away from the hope and the happiness that we have in God because that's what most people are looking for in this world, but it's just a misplaced value for them. Thank you for your time. Uh, we will pick up with right versus wrong next week and spend the next uh, probably about the rest of this month, this month on that. Thank you. Hello.
It's good to see you all this evening. If you will go ahead and mark in your songbooks, uh, big songbooks, number 166. Number 166, He Loved Me So, will be the song of invitation after Bill Carlton's lesson tonight. And after spot checking, I'm pretty sure every songbook has a number zero. And if so, we're singing number zero. Sing and rejoice in the Savior's birth. Hopefully everybody's number zero is also the same. We'll sing all three verses. Consider for just a few moments tonight the birth of Jesus. The beautiful song helps us think about that. It's a very exciting time in the Bible. Uh, the proclamation, the announcement of his birth is a, a beautiful story. And uh, I thought we might read from Luke chapter 2, uh, the passage that kind of covers that uh, experience. If you recall, Luke tells us the story of, of Christ's life, like so many of the uh, Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and even John. Uh, Matthew, Mark, and Luke seem to cover the details of his birth 
uh, to some degree. And uh, starting in verse 1 of Luke chapter 2, uh, Luke references the early period uh, of the first century. It says, it comes, came about in those days that a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that a census should be taken of all the inhabited earth. This was the first census taken while Quirinius was governor of Syria, and all were going to register for the census, each to his own city. Joseph went up from Galilee, from the city of Nazareth to Judea, to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and family of David, in order to register along with Mary, who was engaged to him and with, was with child. It came about while they were there, the days were completed for her to give birth, and she gave birth to her firstborn son, and she wrapped him in clothes and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. In the same region there were shepherds staying out in the fields, keeping watch over their flocks by night. And an angel of the Lord suddenly stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terribly frightened. And the angel said to them, Do not be afraid, for behold, I bring you good news of a great joy which shall be for all people. Today, in the city of David, there has been born for you a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in clothes, lying in a manger. Suddenly there appeared with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace among men with whom he is pleased. It came about when the angels had gone away from them into heaven that the shepherds began saying to one another, Let us go straight to Bethlehem then and see this thing that has happened which the Lord has made known to us. And they came in haste and they found their way to Mary and Joseph and the baby as he lay in the manger. If you look at uh, verse 11, there's an announcement about the birth of Christ. Probably all of us have had some announcement at our birth that our parents put forth about uh, height and weight. A uh, healthy baby, date of birth. Uh, this is a beautiful announcement. It has the who, what, when, where, like we heard about in class tonight. Where? In the city of David. Who? The audience is everyone, and uh, in particular the shepherds, but in particular the who is Christ, the Savior. What happened? He was born. And what is important about that is that he is Christ the Lord, the Savior. And uh, so you hear that announcement. It's a statement. Uh, it's a clear statement but it leads to something akin to an invitation, which we're talking about tonight, a call, uh, and that is hinted at in verse 12. There is a sign for you, you will find the baby wrapped in clothes, lying in a manger. It's not enough to just know beautiful and awesome facts about Christ. Uh, that, that won't get you into heaven, that won't save you. There has to be action, and in this case, there was obvious action. The, uh, the shepherds made a decision to leave their flocks behind, and do something that was, at this moment in, in human history, the most important thing they could do. It says they discussed it among themselves, they had no doubt what they should do. And in verse 16 it says they came in haste, they acted quickly. They didn't sit around and think about it, they didn't put it off, uh, and of course this experience was possibly so overwhelming you'd be hard pressed not to do that. Uh, as you as a person tonight might think about your life before Christ, rec recognize that there are awesome and amazing things happening in heaven right now that can save us. Uh, Jesus is standing before God interceding for all mankind and wants to save us. And uh, that's the same beautiful story we're reading about here. Hopefully that will motivate you when we are singing this song to think about your life and decide if you need to do something tonight uh, to save your soul, uh, to offer prayers personally to God for things in your life that you need to do or to come forward and ask for the uh, support of the congregation here. We ask you to do that while we stand and sing. Why did my Savior come to
also good to hear of the message of the full life of Christ, of his birth, and everything that leads to after that. Uh, we always remember the importance of his death and of his resurrection, and to be reminded of his lowly beginning on this earth can be humbling for us as well. If you would remain standing for our closing prayer by Patrick, and then be seated afterwards and we'll have some announcements. Bow with me, please. Dear God, Lord, we come to you this evening. Thank you for all the different blessings you've given us, earth, Lord. We have so many different blessings in this country, Lord, the freedoms that we enjoy to be able to come together, to worship you, to have your word in a language we can easily understand, to be surrounded by so many like-minded Christians to, that share the faith, that help to strengthen and encourage each other. We thank you for this local congregation, for the elders and deacons who help guide it. We pray that you be with them and their families, help them to always be helping to strengthen this church and helping to guide it, Lord. Lord, we especially thank you for your son, Jesus Christ, your only, uh, who died on the cross for mission of our sins. Lord, we thank you for all that he did for us, the unworthy that we might be, that through his sacrifice we have the hope to be with you. And as we've discussed this evening and heard about his birth as well as just his life, we ask that you help us to always be striving to emulate his perfect life, knowing that we might fall short, Lord, that we, and that we will fall short. We ask that you help us to seek forgiveness when we do sin, that you help us to see the air in our ways, turn from them, do them no more, and be strengthened and encouraged to strive to be better servants of yours, serving you and growing closer to you day by day. Lord, it is time that we ask that you pray with those members of this local congregation who are suffering and are weak spiritually and those who are suffering physically, that you might restore them uh, back to the faith for those who are suffering uh, spiritually and restore those uh, physically if it be your will and in both cases that you help us to be there for our fellow Christians that we might be a source of strength and encouragement to them. Lord as we go <clears throat> back in the world as we go back to our jobs and to our lives we ask that you help us to always keep the focus on you and on the things above Lord rather than the things from below that we always be studying your word, gaining further insight to it, and growing closer to you day by day. Lord, let your word be a light into our footsteps. Help us to always be your humble servants, and let us live our lives in such a way that we might be a good example of those in the world around, that others might see you living uh, through us and be drawn closer to you, Lord. As we pray in Jesus' name, amen. Good evening, everyone.